welcome to another episode of Book Report. I'm Lisa Brower, and I am joined by Mark Evelsizer, who is Director of Information Technology at the Linda Hall Library. And we're here today to talk about one of his favorite books, which <laughs> is Richard Power's book called The Overstory. And Mark, you know this, it's been called an eco-epic, a fable, a meditation, and a work of activism and, and resistance. And I think you'd probably agree with all of that. It, it, the, the more time, this is my second reading of it, and, um, and the more time I spend with it, I see how, how meticulous Richard Powers was in getting his themes woven throughout the book. It's just delightful. And it changed my life, actually. We, we did, took a California vacation to see the trees that he talks about here. Well, and speaking of trees, the book is about nine Americans whose unique life experiences with trees bring them together to address the destruction of forests. And Powers was inspired to write this book while teaching at Stanford University where he encountered the giant redwood trees for the first time. And what I didn't know until I started doing some background reading about this book is that Powers really didn't know much about trees at all before uh, contemplating writing the book. And in preparation for writing his story, he read over 120 books about trees to become knowledgeable about them. Hmm. And um, as a result, he has learned a great deal about trees, that they have amazing capabilities, that they actually form communities. And there are a number of things that trees do that are very much like people, that they are social creatures. One of the things, I, I've, I've read three of Richard Power's books now, this is the first one, and one of the things I love about his books is his love of nature and that I learn, I learn a lot about his subject matter from his book, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like, um, it doesn't feel like hard work. It, it, it's, it's engaging and entertaining while I'm learning, so I love that. Um, one of, one of the ones that I had no idea is that fish can live in the boughs of, or in the, the, the roof tops of trees and um, that there's water pools big enough that the fish has never seen water outside of the tree. Uh, that just is amazing to me. I know. That one really caught me off guard. I, I never would have imagined that in a million years. But, you know, what struck me was the social aspect of trees, that, that they care for one another, that they have ways to communicate with one another, um, that they trade goods and services. And that if one tree is suffering, other trees coalesce around it and, and try to heal it and make it into a healthy tree again. Right. And I had absolutely no knowledge of this right. at all. The communication. One of, one of the characters, um, Patricia Westford, um, she, she does this experiment where she puts some bags on some tree limbs and she finds that they use chemicals to call when they're in need and they use their roots to share nutrients when there's one that's hurting and it was it was really amazing yeah and, and that was just the factual information that we could derive <laughs> from the book but uh, there is this very complicated work of fiction that he unspools and the book itself um, is very complex it's quite long and there's a lot to keep track of so um, to just enumerate there are nine main characters Eight become activists, two end up in federal custody, one dies, one commits suicide, and two go into hiding. It was, it was very, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a complicated book. Yeah. Um, uh, Olive, Olive Kittredge is another book I love where it's these stories where these characters have their independent lives, but they get woven together. In, in this book, kind of like the first third of it are these stories that seem to have nothing to do with each other, but each character has a major tree that's a part of their life. And then there's this hinge, and, and the people start being drawn together. That's true. And, you know, of the nine, there is one scientist um, named Patricia Westerford, whose life was actually inspired by a real-life uh, scientist, um, the, the ecologist, the forest ecologist, Suzanne Samard. Hmm. But as far as we know, and as far as, as Powers has indicated, all the other um, people in the book are complete works of fiction but they include two psychologists, one lawyer, one Vietnam vet who becomes an eco-terrorist, one software developer, one student, one artist and um, who's a photographer, and one artist who's a ceramicist and later becomes a counselor. And, uh, you know, I, I, I came to love most, or maybe all the characters. Um, Patricia Westford 
her relationship with her father was, I thought, especially poignant. And he, one of the experiments he has her do is to put a tree in a dirt in a container and says, come back here after some years and see if the dirt has changed. And what she finds is that the tree has grown amazingly and it takes its substance not from the ground, but from the light and water that it, and the air that it receives. Mm -hmm. And so amazing that a tree builds itself out of things that we take for granted. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the wondrous things that, that we learn about trees in this book. But I think once, you know, he spends about a third of the book introducing us to all of these characters. And one of the challenges I found is that uh, he'll spend a chapter introducing us to one character and then move on to another set of characters. And then 300 pages later, you, you come <laughs> back to somebody else. And it's really important, if you haven't read this book, it's really important to take notes while you're reading um, or else you're going to have to go back and, and do a lot of rereading. But once he, he introduces us to all of these characters who are moving gradually closer and closer together when they coalesce around one event, Powers is really asking the central question, what the expletive deleted went wrong with mankind? Or perhaps why haven't we taken note of the grandeur of nature and trees and why are we killing ourselves due to our own blindness? And that to me is really the central question of this book. The, the, there's several themes in here and we're, we're not gonna have time to talk about all of them, but I, I agree with you that there are there are trees that people just walk by, that his characters walk by, and don't notice for years at a time. And then something happens, and the people kind of wake up uh, to the beauty and amazement that's there. Now, Patricia, she lives in um, a ranger's cabin, and she is immersed in it all the way through. But the other characters um, are awakened, in a sense, and, mm -hmm. and Powers invites us to be awakened along with them. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the things that occurred to me, and I sure occurred to you as you read and reread the book, um, was that as much reverence as Powers has for trees, and justifiably so, that the trees are ultimately a metaphor for something else, the tree of life, mm -hmm. um, nature, and mankind. And, um, you know, why would anyone, the other subsidiary question is, why would anyone want to destroy all of this, which we are consciously and unconsciously doing? Right. And I think that, you know, through the events of this book and the, the big act of eco-terrorism, which really lies at the center of the book, um, is I think Powers means it as a wake-up call to all of us that not only are we murdering nature and murdering our forests, but we're sort of committing a slow suicide, right. a mass suicide. Right. And, he, and, and Powers hits on that suicide thread several points in the book. Um, one of the characters parents um, commit suicide pretty early on and it's kind of puzzling but then as you say powers invites us to see not only the beauty and the grandeur of the trees but how we're doing ourselves as humanity in that n nature will persist it's whether the earth remains habitable for us or not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and you know that is um, when he's talking about human biases you know he implies that humankind is deeply ill and that as a species we won't last very long, but that once mankind clears out, the earth will heal itself again. And, and there's a renewal and an opportunity to start all over again. And it reminded me of a nonfiction book that was published in 2007 called The World Without Us, which hypothesizes you know, if mankind and, and all um, life forms other than vegetation vanished from the earth overnight, what would happen? And he goes, you know, in one month this would happen, the author does, mm -hmm. and in six months this would happen, and in 10 years this would happen. And gradually towards the end of the book, the, the earth has renewed itself. I've seen, you know, AI is potentially one of the big technology changes going on in our world right now, and I've seen pictures where people have fabricated how long would it take for nature to reclaim some of our major cities mm -hmm. and what might that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and Power, Power's engagement with technology is interesting too. He has a background in um, software development and so he's familiar with it and you can tell he kind of likes it but he also chides us for it. Mm -hmm. um, at one point he talks about 
that convenience is our God and because of that is part of the reason why we're destroying ourselves and he, he says once you've ordered a book in your pajamas there's no going back. <laughs> That's true and one of the overwhelming uh, feelings I had upon finishing this book was one of guilt for having read it in paper form. <laughs> uh, so I thought how many trees died to make this book. Um, but yes, I, I think he, he tries to be balanced about it and quite honestly it's an outward reflection of, of the way Power's mind is organized because on one hand he was an English major as an undergraduate but he was also trained as a computer scientist and worked as a computer programmer and software developer. So he is truly somebody who is using both sides of his brain Definitely. and that's very evident in, in this text. I think too, um, Powers, Powers, as you say, about bias. He's got one of the characters who's a sociologist, and so he talks a lot about brain biases and that we tend to believe what the people around us believe rather than really assessing things. Um, but he also, Powers has one of his characters say that the best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. And so I kind of wonder, maybe Powers is hoping that this will be that story mm -hmm that will change some people's minds. That could very well be. And I think that, you know, you could sort of make that argument reflecting the logic through the various characters in the book because each one represents a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that very well could be. And you and I also talked about going back to the uh, metaphor of, of mass suicide that, you know, there are a couple of suicides and deaths in the book, but that at the end there's one character who is a survivor of the um, eco-terrorism that is at the heart of the plot, and he is so guilt-ridden. Uh, when these people are brought to justice, he easily could have been exonerated, and yet he chooses to implicate himself where he hmm. was not guilty and suffer the consequence because he is so guilt-ridden right. to go to jail for a life sentence, what we are led to believe is in maybe supermax prison. So that's a sort of metaphorical death. He is metaphorically right. being buried alive. Right. Um, and he represents an extreme case of consciousness and guilt about what we are doing to the environment. Right. And I, I felt one of the one of the places where Powers invites us to think about this self-destruction and what do we need to do for the for the climate and for the trees. Um, there's an event where several characters are together and one is giving a, a lecture and Powers invites us to think, is she going to kill herself uh, on this stage or is she going to um, continue her endeavors? And it was like holding my breath as I was reading it and Powers kind of wants to have it both ways. He kind of says, in this other universe, perhaps, perhaps she does this, but in this universe she does that, and I'll leave it to the reader to, uh, to see what happens there. But I feel like powers within himself might be wrestling with, is it too late, or is there still time if we take heed to, to preserve ourselves and our earth as it is? Mm -hmm. I, I think that could very well be part of his motivation with that character, but that leads me to uh, another topic that you and I talked about in, in considering this book, and that is the, the notion that of whether or not this story actually occurred, <laughs> or was it the product of a stroke victim's mind? There is a character in the book who is a lawyer, an intellectual property lawyer, who comes up with a, an interesting question about whether or not trees have um, intellectual property rights. Right, right. Which is not a question that's <laughs> answered, but one I'd certainly like to ponder some more. Um, but he suffers a, a stroke, a, a debilitating stroke, uh, late in the book. And we're left, I think, to wonder, there is the possibility that maybe this whole elaborate story was the product of, of what was going in his, on in his mind. I mean, he, he was minimally conscious, but certainly could not. We don't know if he was able to receive information. He certainly couldn't express himself. And it, it reminded me a little bit of a Faulknerian mm. um, tactic, like, you know, as I lay dying and sound and fury, the, the notion of an interior monologue. Was this whole book an interior monologue uh, of, that was produced by somebody who was bedridden with a stroke? Right. And we've been talking about some of the themes, but the characters are wonderful too, and I became very attached to them. The, the, the couple you were talking about, let me just read a little quote. Um, 
um, this lawyer meets someone in community theater and, um, and he describes her and their relationship as this. He, he writes this to her. You have given me a thing I could never have imagined. Before I knew you, it's like I had the word book and you put one in my hands. I had the word game and you taught me how to play. I had the word life and then you came along and said, oh, you mean this. Um, so their relationship was fascinating and it takes some turns. But one of the themes I loved in the book was about pace. And mm -hmm. I felt like Powers was inviting us to slow down and perhaps then we can see the grandeur of the trees and what they're capable of. Um, and this character and his uh, partner, they did all kinds of adventurous things, but his stroke slowed him down to the point where his pace was tree-like or geologic mm -hmm. rather than what it had been. Yeah, I think there are any number of times throughout the book where Powers is imploring us to just slow down slow down our pace of life, slow down our breathing, and in fact, one character says, if our eyes could only leave our screens and see the beauty. Yes. You know, step away from the screen, step outside, and I think that is such a, a profound observation because, you know, especially now as we're approaching the summer season, and I remember as a child being told to get up and get out before the sun goes down and go out and play and come back, dinner will be at six o'clock. Um, and now children seem to spend most of their time indoors, in front of their screens, right. with their phones, and who plays anymore. So, I'm, I mean, it, it's so profound, and, and those patterns set a lifelong habit, I think. And he's imploring us, go outside, enjoy nature, right. see the beauty, and maybe once we understand what our habits are doing to this earth, we'll give give them second thoughts yes. and, and slow down a little bit. Yes. And I think he ends the, the book by calling us to slow our pace and there is that big message that is written on the ground, seen from above, it's the word still. Right. Um, it was, you know, it's a fantastic book and preparing for discussing it with you, I just see all the places that he, he weaves that in. Um, as you say, one of the characters laments the coming of artificial reality and mixed reality where we abandon the real life um, and the character says something about we'll, we'll uh, abandon the real life for bits and scores and uh, likes to the point where we can't even remember the tune of real life. Mm -hmm. um, so Powers is definitely trying to call us call us to that. He plays the game the other way too. Mm -hmm. He has an artificial intelligence agent um, and, and let me see if I can read that quote. Um, he, he's talking about artificial intelligence, and, he, and, and the character, Nile, describes them as living things. He says almost to himself, self-learning, self-creating. The whole room laughs, but he doubles down so fast that they'll think we're not even here. So kind of in the way that we disregard trees, Powers is investing a... Uh, inviting us to think, th this could happen to us too. The, the computers could get so fast that they don't value us or see that we can communicate, you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying, <laughs> and I think when, when we consider the, the speed with which artificial intelligence is, is entering our lives, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but it seems to be entering our lives with increased velocity lately. Yes, I think this is a very important warning. <laughs> um, you know, before our, our future robot overlords take over. <laughs> um, yes, I do think that, that one of the overarching messages of this book is slow down, remember what it means to be human, remember what it means to be a human being amidst other species um, and vegetation and to care for it before it's too late. I think it's very much a Jeremiah. Um, in, in different clothing. I won't say in, in, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing, but I think it cloaks itself in this very elaborate story. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you break it down into its component parts and see the themes that resonate throughout the book, I think this is one of the overarching themes he wants us to take away. And, you know, it's not for no reason that, that the critic Peter Brooks has called Powers a historian of contemporary society because I think he very much, because he's able to balance the humanistic approach with the technological mm -hmm. approach, both sides of his brain, right. um, that he is really very 
able to reflect contemporary society in all of his novels, but this one especially, and I know this one's very close to your heart. Um, you know, one other thing I, I want to explore before we wrap up, and that is the notion that this book is constructed like a tree. Mm. You know, that its sections are, you know, root, branch, not branches, I, I memorized it last night, but it's uh, root, trunk, right. crown, seeds. Right. And it's interesting that it, that it ends with seeds rather than begins with seeds. Yes. Uh, because that, again, reinforces the life cycle. It's a mature tree that gives off seeds that will then result eventually in, in new trees. Right. Being born. And, and the seed he's planting in us to care for such things. And he, you know, just looking at the table of contents, he, the shape of the words in the table of contents are like a tree. And mm -hmm. so it's like, he, he's just so thoroughly, you know, he's writing on all, all, uh, all eight cylinders here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's very elaborately constructed. And, and the, the book is constructed like a tree and the characters move closer and closer to one another in concentric circles, much as a tree grows. Mm -hmm. it grows the trunk mm -hmm. grows out right. in concentric circles. So there's a lot going on here. He packs a lot into what a mere 600 pages. No, it's not that long. <laughs> um, it's about 400 pages, I think. Um, but it's a very densely plotted, very rich book that um, requires close attention. And I think in closing, you know, um, one of the questions that he leaves us with is what wouldn't a person do to help the most wondrous products of four billion years of creation? And, and as we read the book, we think that he's having us think about trees in that regard. And at one point, he invites us to consider, when we cut down a tree, we need to consider what a tremendous gift that is mm -hmm. and appreciate it. Um, um, but but in the end, he ends up saying the trees are really trying to save us because we may destroy the, habitable, the habitability of the planet for humans, but nature, as you say, will continue on. So it kind of looks like Powers is saying humans are that, uh, that product of evolution over those extended period of time. And if we want to save ourselves, we need to regard nature with a higher regard. I think that that is very true, and that's a, a good way to end this discussion. So, Mark, I think is if there's anything else you want to say, I want to. I'd book? like to add okay. one, I, one. I knew there would be. I want to add one anecdote. Okay. Um, man, there's so there's so much we didn't get to talk about. There, the, Powers does so much with uh, technology and with religious um, allegory, or not allegory, but illusions. Um, I I had given this to a English teacher friend of mine, and she loved it. She gave it to her daughter. And she reported that her daughter, after reading it, said, I found a new religion, and it's trees. And um, my friend said, well, I'm glad you finally picked one. <laughs> well, and that is a whole other discussion, and we sort of had that before, uh, about you know, what are the religious overtones in this book, if any. And I think that it's not that Powers is necessarily um, directing us towards any one belief system other than to, there is a spirituality about yes, this book, yes. and an appreciation of nature does not necessarily conform to a particular belief system, but a spirituality that this is something greater than humans. Yes, yes. Um, so yes, I would definitely agree with that. And with that, Mark, I think we've probably said all we can say in the time allotted. It's been great. I highly recommend reading it. <laughs> Go ahead and read it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.